evil lurks in the hearts of men. The shadow knows. <laughs> Your local blue coal dealer presents The Shadow. These half-hour dramatizations are designed to forcibly demonstrate to old and young alike that crime does not pay. Before the final broadcast of this Shadow series begins, keep this fact in mind, homeowners. One way to be sure of maintaining steady, even temperatures throughout your home during these changeable days and nights of March and April weather is by burning blue coal. Blue coal is America's finest anthracite. It gives perfect, dependable warmth and stops overheating or quick chilling of rooms. Remember the name Blue Coal for better heat with less furnace attention in all kinds of weather. And be sure to hold on at the close of today's shadow story, for we have an unusual treat in store for you. The shadow, mysterious character who aids those in distress and helps the forces of law and order is in reality Lamont Cranston, wealthy young man about town. Cranston's friend and companion, the lovely Margot Lane, is the only person who knows to whom the unseen voice belongs. Today's story, Can the Dead Talk? Oh, good afternoon, Miss Lane. Hello, Ames. Mr. Cranston in? Uh, yes, Miss Lane. I want you... Hello, Margot. Hurry up, Lamont. We'll be late for Aunt Eliza's big charity benefit. She's been working on it for the last six months. Now, come on. Oh, all right. Get my coat, Ames, please. Yes. Honestly, Lamont, you're acting like a little boy who doesn't want to go to dancing school. He'll probably enjoy it. This man, Voltan, is supposed to be very good. Margot, I don't like mind readers. He isn't a mind reader. He calls himself a mentalist. Well, it means the same thing to me. Well, I understand he's fascinating. When he's not performing on the stage, he goes around exploding the myths of haunted houses and things like that. He doesn't believe in ghosts. Oh, my... Your coat, sir. My coat? Oh, yes. Thanks, thanks. Listen, Margot, I've got to be back at 6 o'clock. There's a polo match at the armory tonight. And I... Yes, yes, I know. I've got a front row seat. And you needn't act like such a martyr. If I can spend the evening watching you trying to break your silly neck playing croquet on horseback, it won't hurt you to go with me this afternoon and have your mind improved. <laughs> Deliver me from a logical woman. <laughs> Very well. Lead on, Macduff. And now I will proceed with my next experiment. You see, Lamont, I told you we'd be late. It started already. Now sit back here and make this as painless as possible. Certain of you in the audience have written on the slips of paper that my assistant distributed questions you would like me to answer. Now, if you will concentrate on what you have written, I will try to get these questions by thought transference. But remember, you must concentrate. I must be in complete accord with your thoughts. I get the initials, E.K. Someone with the initials E.K. wants to know the date of her marriage. I think it was... Yes, I'm sure it was. March 24th, 1903. Is that right? Oh, yes, that's right. Did you hear that, Lamont? He's marvelous, don't you think? That's an understatement. Oh, don't be so superior. Everybody, please concentrate. I cannot conduct this experiment in thought transference without sympathetic cooperation from my audience. Now, now I get the initials BDM. BDM wants to know the street, number, and city where he was born. Street is Walnut, the number 2124, the city of Philadelphia. Am I right? Gee, he got it. He's marvelous. How do you suppose he does it? Elementary, my dear Watson. Wait, please. Before I proceed further, I feel that in this room there is someone who is not only an unbeliever, but one who is distinctly hostile to me and what I am trying to do. Dear Lamont, he must mean you. Not probably part of it. I would like that person to attempt a little experiment with me. If he or she will think of something, some question, the answer to which is known to no one else, I will attempt to answer it correctly without the person having written the question down at all. If I can answer it correctly, it should prove to the skeptic that the transference of thought from one mind to another is completely possible. Nice trick if we can do it. You don't think it's possible, Lamada? Oh, I won't say it's impossible, but it's certainly highly unlikely. Well, think of something and concentrate on it and see if you can get it. I will not. In the first place, you don't know that I was the one he was referring to. In the second place, even if I were, I wouldn't give him the satisfaction. You think of something that no one could possibly know but yourself. I'll bet you 100 to 1 he can't get it. Well, perhaps you're right. Quiet, please. Quiet. 
Someone in the audience is concentrating on the question, who is the shadow? Margot, did you think of that just then? Yes, but I don't know why. It just seemed to come into my head. Much I think... will answer that question. No. No, on second thought, I believe I will not give the answer after all. Unless I am very much mistaken, the shadow himself is present. And I don't believe this is just the time to remove his veil of secrecy. However, in case the shadow thinks this is merely a sham, I would like to inform him that within an hour, he will receive a cablegram from someone he never heard of. What do you suppose that means? I haven't the faintest idea. I will now idea. proceed with the questions that have been written on the papers. Someone whose initials are LCZ wants to know the number of a license plate on his car. Oh, Lamont, let's get out of here. You can go if you like, my dear Margot. But I'm going to stay till the end. For heaven's sake, why? After the performance, I think the shadow will pay a little call on Mr. Voltan. I'm consumed with a burning desire to find out just what he knows. Close the door, Emil. I wish to dress. Yes, master. Remove my boots. Yes, master. I'm careful, you clumsy fool. What's the matter with you? I'm sorry, Imbecile, master. go. Leave me alone. Yes, master. I will. Well, what's the matter? But the door. The door knob turned. The door is opening. But the hall is empty. Ah, uh, good afternoon. Well, come in. Have you gone mad, master? There is no one here. You are wrong, Emil. There is someone here. But I see no one. Of course not. You may leave us alone, Emil. Yes, master. Well, Shadow. Well, Voltan. Sit down, won't you? Unfortunately, I can't stay. I have an engagement. Really? Perhaps your engagement is with that well-known clubman, Mr. Lamont Cranston. Is Lamont Cranston a friend of yours? No. As a matter of fact, we've just now met. Interesting. True. Why beat about the bush, Shadow? I know perfectly well that you are Lamont Cranston. Are you sure you haven't got me confused with someone else? Quite. Of course, at the moment, I admit I'm unable to see you, owing to a trick of visual hypnotics, which it is hardly worth my while to come back. However, your charming companion this afternoon, Miss Lane, wasn't it? Let her mind dwell on the subject quite intensely. Her thought waves were unmistakable. On second thought, I find I can spare you a few minutes of all time. <laughs> Good. My respect for your powers is increasing momentarily. Well, now that you know, what are you going to do about it? I haven't decided yet. Remember, I and I alone know that Lamont Cranston and the Shadow are one and the same, with the exception of your friend Margot Lane. Of course, you realize how much your life would be worth if the underworld should ever learn that you are the Shadow? I have a rough idea. And yet that would be a pity. To terminate so unceremoniously the brilliant capabilities of one who was the Shadow is known and feared throughout the world. Just what are you getting at? Let me tell you a little story, my friend. Did you ever hear of Anton Proskovai? Anton Proskovai? The famous anarchist who at one time or another was kicked out of every country in Europe? That's the man. Well, the last I heard of him was some ten years ago, when he was sent into exile. He's supposed to have died there. Anton Proskovai didn't die in exile. He escaped. But he dropped out of sight for ten years because he was making a study of that least understood attribute of mankind. The human mind. You mean you? Yes. I am Anton Proskovai. You, Anton Proskovai? The man without a country? I do not need a country. What do you mean? Shadow, when I started my studies of the brain, I quickly found that people mentally are like sheep. They can be influenced, swayed in any direction by a mentality stronger and superior than their own. Of course. That's nothing particularly new. Wait, wait. After I had made my escape for years, I wandered, living in ditches, eating in pigsties, hounded from country to country by government agents. But all the time, I was collecting subjects. Subjects? Yes, Shadow. Among the submerged, ill-used, half-starved rabble of every nation, there are potential leaders. Leaders who, given the opportunity, could be the dictators of tomorrow. Go on. These men I know. I know them so intimately that from wherever I am, I can control their minds. You saw Emil, my servant. He is completely subjugated to my will. But that's hypnotism. Relatively simple. Not at all. 
is not hypnotism. Although I dominate Emil's mind whenever I wish, to all appearances, he is a normal human being. He can be released only if I feel fear. And I am never afraid. Only if you feel fear. I put the idea of the shadow's identity in Miss Lane's mind this afternoon. After which she unknowingly, yet obligingly, answered it mentally. Come in. Excuse me, master. I have a cablegram here. It is addressed to someone called the shadow in your care. Yes, I will take it and see that it's delivered. Go now. Yes, master. You see, shadow? You mean... On the platform this afternoon, I willed one of my subjects in Europe to cable you, saying the downtrodden shall arise. Here, I will open your cablegram. I'll put it on the table where you can see it. Well, what does it say? The downtrodden shall arise. Well, that's amazing. Now do you believe me, Shadow? Through my subjects who are leaders themselves, I can control the vast mass mind of the rabble, the bulk of the population of the world. I suppose it's possible at that. Possible? Listen, Shadow. I have decided that in exactly one week, the vast uprising which I have so carefully planned for years will take place. Governments will be overthrown. Nations will exist no more. Chaos will reign. Yes, it could be done. It will be done. Why are you telling me this? Because on the threshold of releasing this world-shattering force, I hesitate. Why, Voltan? Because I and I alone can bring this chaos about. But after it's accomplished, then what? How can I control what I have created? Somewhat of a problem, I should think. Yes. I need another mind to share the responsibility. A mind which already has superhuman powers that I could train to assist me in the great work of reorganizing the world. And you want me to join you, is that it? Why not? Shadow between us, we could rule the world. Suppose I refuse. Then I shall be forced to divulge the secret of your identity to those who would be most interested. After which I shall proceed with my plans alone. I see. But you won't refuse. Join forces with me, Shadow. Next week, we will plunge the world into chaos such as it has not known since the dawn of creation. A chaos over which you and I will reign supreme. Well, your answer? Give me 24 hours. Can you not answer me now? 24 hours. I will give you seven hours. That is time enough. Come to me at midnight tonight. Where will I find you? You know the old Murray Mansion in the slums over by the river? Of course. It's been boarded up for years. It's supposed to be haunted, I believe. Haunted. Yes. That's why I use it for my headquarters. A reputation for ghosts is very convenient for keeping away prying eyes. I will be waiting there for you tonight at midnight. And I advise you to come alone. Lamont is certainly distinguishing himself tonight. I never saw such rides. I wish he wouldn't take such chances. Oh, He's not taking any more chances than we are, sitting down here in the front row. Oh, we're pretty, pretty close at these indoor polo matches. <laughs> close? <laughs> Honestly, Margo, any minute I expect to look up and find a horse sitting in my lap. <laughs> There goes Lamont again. He's got the ball. No, the back man is riding him off. Oh! What happened? Oh, Evelyn, what happened? I don't know. I think Lamont's pony must have stumbled. Lamont's fallen off. The pony's running loose. Lamont's still on the ground. Here, here, help me over this barrier. I'm going to. Hey, stand back. Get me Get a doctor. He may be badly injured. I can hear you. Oh, Evelyn. Oh, Evelyn. He's hurt. He's lying there so still and white. Lamont, speak to me. Margo, now take it easy. Here comes Dr. Carlson. Oh, thank goodness. He's Lamont's doctor. All right, stand aside, please. I'm a doctor. Oh, Dr. Carlson, thank God you've come. Do you think Lamont's hurt badly? And I can't tell yet. I'll have to examine him. Well, what is it? Tell me, can't you? Miss Lane, I'd rather do anything in the world than tell you this. Oh. Lamont Franson is dead. <laughs> Act two of today's story commences in just a moment. But first, here's advice homeowners everywhere will certainly profit by following. Your nearest blue coal dealer has a real bargain for you. 
It's the John Barclay Summer Conditioning Service. A thorough cleaning and checkup job that'll put your heating plant in perfect shape for next fall and save you money on your fuel bill. This summer conditioning service includes cleaning all inside and outside surfaces, cleaning and reassembling the smoke pipe and sealing all openings at joints where the pipe joins the chimney. This service also includes a thorough check of all dampers, valves, pipes, and grates, plus the painting of all doors and surfaces. In fact, it gives you over ten vital money-saving jobs that will improve the efficiency of your furnace, all for the price of one. It's worth twelve dollars and a half, yet it only costs approximately five dollars for the average size home. So next month, or whenever you decide to let your furnace fire go out, get in touch with your nearest blue coal dealer. Let him give your home heating plant, whether it's steam, warm air, or hot water, a thorough summer condition. You'll save time, trouble, and money in the long run. And remember, too, if you want steady, more dependable heat in your home throughout the changeable weather of early spring, order blue coal. You'll get better heat with less furnace attention. take you home. Oh, but I... Oh, there's somebody in the hall. Evelyn, don't let them come in here. I can't face any more people. It's probably Ames. Come here, Margot, in this alcove. Nobody will notice you. I'm afraid I can't stand much This way, sir. Mr. Cranston's death was a terrible shock to me. Have you an old friend of Mr. Cranston, sir? I don't seem to remember. Well, not exactly an old friend, but considering the length of our acquaintance, fairly intimate one. Yes, sir. If you will just step in here, sir, you may view that... Evelyn, that man. Who was it? No one I ever saw before. His name's Voltan. He's a mind reader. He gave a performance this afternoon at Aunt Eliza's charity benefit. Oh, that was strange of him. But you know, Lamont did have some weird friends. But he wasn't a friend of Lamont. I mean, I... I don't think he was. I wonder just... To... Uh, very sad to see a man cut down in his crime. Uh, oh, I beg your pardon. Miss Lane, isn't it? Why, yes. I thought so. May I tender my sympathy, Miss Lane? Thank you. I know how you must feel. Great pity. Anson had a future. Possibly a greater future than even you suspect. Well, what's done is done. I must be going now. I beg pardon, sir. Uh, I'll, uh, I can find my way out. Oh, now, Margot, darling. <laughs> won't you please let me take you home? Ames will take care of everything here, won't you, Ames? Yes, miss. I'll get your things. Oh, all right, Evelyn. I suppose there's nothing more I can do tonight. I'll go. Good. And I'm going with you, just to be sure you get there. It's almost midnight, Emil. You may leave me now. Master, are you sure you would rather not have me to stay here? Stay? No, you fool. Why should you stay? I do not know. I... Do not see how you can remain here alone, Master. Night after night, there is something about this old ruined house. It, it is evil. Nonsense. What's evil about it? In the neighborhood, they say it is haunted. They say the talk, ghost... Talk, talk. That is all. There is no such thing as a ghost. To a trained mind, a ghost is an impossibility. Therefore, it does not exist. You understand? Yes, Master. I shall be quite all right. What's that? Ah, just a loose shutter in the wind. Master is worried. I have never seen you so before. I've had rather an upsetting occurrence tonight. I must think things out. Go, Emil. Yes, Master. The usual time in the morning. Of course. Now go. Yes, Master. Yes, I go. Fool. Emil is an idiot. Trying to frighten me with this old woman's tale about ghosts. Ghosts do not frighten me. Nothing frightens me. If I knew fear, I couldn't hope to control the world. 
Ah, so now Lamont Cranston is dead. I must proceed alone. But I must hurry before anything else goes wrong. I will not wait a week. Tomorrow I shall call upon my subjects to arise and kill. Tomorrow. It's a pity the shadow is gone. He would have enjoyed it. I could have taught him so many things. What a magnificent conception. The shadow. <laughs> huh? What was that? I could have sworn I heard someone laugh. No. No one is here. No one could be here. It must have been in my mind. <laughs> That's right, Voltan. In your mind. Who's that? Who speaks? Is it possible you don't know me, Voltan? When just this evening you claimed to be one of my most intimate friends? Shadow. Or his ghost? No. No, it's not possible. Really? With my own eyes, I saw you lying dead. I know. So thoughtful of you to call. Stop! It can't be you! It can't! You hear me, don't you? I'm imagining things. My mind is overstrained, that's all. The shadow is dead. You see, it's midnight, Voltan. I have returned from the spirit world to keep our appointment. Spirit world? There is no such thing. That can't be. I won't allow myself to believe it. You're afraid, Voltan? No, no. I'm not afraid. You are afraid for the first time in your life. You're afraid. At last, the thousands of subjects you've held under your spell are liberated, are free. Who is there? It is Emil. You must remember me, master. Your loyal servant, Emil. The one whom you have subjected to your indignities for so long. You've gone mad. Now, Voltan, it is you who have gone mad. There is but one way to deal with a mad dog. Keep away from me, Emil. Don't come any closer. This gun. I will shoot! Drop that gun. Ah, Emil. I didn't mean it. Uh, Stop, Emil. Stop following me. You wounded me, Volcan. But before I die, I am going to kill you. I am not afraid of you anymore. You are afraid of me. No, don't touch me. Don't you... There. He's dead. I... I am free. At last. Four o'clock. It'll be dawn soon, Margot. I'm I'm all right now, Evelyn. Why don't you go home yourself? You don't need to stay with me anymore. Well, if you're sure you're all right. Oh, of course I'm all right. I'll take a sedative and go to bed. Good, and get some rest. I could use some rest myself. Oh, you could. Well, if you want anything, don't hesitate to call me, Margot. If I don't hear from you, I'll drop over in the afternoon. All right, and thanks, Evelyn, for sticking by me. You've, you've been a great help. Oh, nonsense. Get some sleep, dear. I thought she'd never go. Oh, Margot, don't you know me? Well, Lamont, Lamont, I must be dreaming. No, you're not dreaming. I'm here. But, well, you, you were killed. No, I wasn't killed, Margot. Oh, Lamont, but I, I don't understand. I, I saw you lying there so cold and still. It was a trick, dear. A matter of suspended animation. I wasn't even hurt. Well, then how? It's quite a common trick in India, and it's been done in this country on several occasions. I've never had need to use it before. Voltan forced me to. Well, how does it work? Well, I... I can best explain it by saying I threw myself into a cataleptic trance. My heart stopped. Everything stopped for a short time. <laughs> Why, it even fooled Dr. Carson. It'll be an awful shock to him when he sees me alive and well. You mean you did it on purpose? Of course. I had to. And you didn't tell me? I could tell no one, Margot. Oh, Lamont, how could you? I know what a shock it must have been for you, darling, but believe me, there was no other way... It was vitally necessary that Lamont Cranston should be thought dead so that Voltan would keep his knowledge of the shadow's identity to himself until I had time to figure a way out. But, Lamont, why didn't you tell me and spare me the suffering? I wouldn't have given you away. I didn't dare take the chance. Voltan might have read your thoughts. A sinister man, Margot, with some rather extraordinary mental capabilities. 
Would it surprise you to know that he had perfected plans for a world revolt? He had? You mean he... Yes. Voltan is dead. As the ghost of the shadow, I faced him tonight in a haunted house. When he thought his mental powers were going back on him, he shot his servant, who very conveniently strangled Voltan before he died, too. Oh, terrible. I don't think so, Margot. There's quite enough unrest among nations today without the machinations of an insane mental genius. Yes, I think the world will be a great deal better off without Mr. Voltan. It's a pity that others with a like capacity for stirring up trouble can't meet the same fate. Now, friends, we have a real treat in store for you. I want you to meet two grand actors. Our stars, Margot Lane, who in reality is the charming Agnes Moorhead, and Lamont Cranston, who is known in real life as Bill Johnstone. Thanks, Ken. Well, Margot, oh, <laughs> I should say Agnes, I know you'll agree with me that it's been a great privilege for you and me to have played the roles of Margot Lane and The Shadow for the past six months. Yes, it has, Bill, and it's been a lot of fun besides... I can't begin to tell you how much I've appreciated being with the Shadow during his exciting adventures. And I know that we appreciate the generous cooperation we've received from our sponsors, the Blue Coal Dealers, in teaching young and old alike that crime doesn't pay. If we succeeded in driving home that moral, then we'll have accomplished our purpose. As Ken Roberts has told you, ladies and gentlemen, this is our final broadcast of the winter season. But we sincerely hope to be back with another series in the fall. Whether or not the Shadow Program returns is up to you, our listeners. In the theater, you know, we actors can tell by the applause if the audience enjoys our efforts to entertain them. But in radio, the only way to know whether or not the audience enjoys the entertainment is by their purchases of the product that makes the program possible or by their personal approval to the sponsors. So, friends... If you've liked this Shadow series and want to hear the show again next fall, won't you phone or write your nearest blue coal dealer and let him know? Your purchases of blue coal and your phone calls to the blue coal dealers will indicate to them whether or not they should bring you the Shadow program again in September. And now, on behalf of our entire cast, hearty thanks to you again for your loyalty to our show and your support of blue coal. Goodbye, Bill and Agnes. We hope you'll be back again in the fall. And friends, remember that you can continue to thrill to the adventures of the shadow during the summer months by getting the Shadow Magazine at your local newsstand. This is Ken Roberts saying goodbye for Blue Coal. Mm-hmm.